church. Give two or three people a high five. Tell them they look good in church and you can be seated. God bless you this morning. Praise the name of the Lord. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. We all have family. Even if you don't know them, you got them. And all families are filled with different levels of relationship. Some families are based off of relationship that is uh, a natural relationship or a biological relationship. Many of us have people that we are so close to that we are closer to them than we are some of our actual family. Uh, and those would be considered like our family of choice. But all family has different levels of relationship. I want to talk about just a few of those levels right now. The first one I would consider a gas station relationship. What I mean by that is when you go and fuel your vehicle up once or twice a week, however often you may need to, you may go to the same convenience store and there may be somebody that works at that particular time that you happen to gas your car up and you might even know their name because you've introduced yourself or because they have it on their shirt or whatever. And you might give them the head nod. They might know how you like your coffee. They might know that when your wife's not looking, you're going to buy some Twinkies, praise the Lord. They might know all these things about you, but you really don't know them. It's a gas station relationship. It's a convenience store relationship. You don't know their birthday. You don't know how many kids they have. You don't know whether they live on Main Street or, or 3rd Street. You, don't, you, you know them, but you don't know them. Does that make sense? Then your day progresses, and you'll find some different levels of relationship, maybe some coworker type relationships. You work in the same job, work in the same building. Maybe that your office is in the same area, or maybe you share an office space, or maybe you, you, you see each other in the break room and... Maybe it's an account representative that comes to the same job site and you do business with them and you've been to their office and they've been to your office. That's a different level of relationship. It's significantly more involved than just the convenience store relationship. You've walked in their office. You've seen the picture so you know they, got, they have kids. You've seen the, the fish hanging on the wall and you know they like to go fishing. You've seen the deer's head hanging on the wall. You know they like to hunt. You, you know a little bit more. You might even know their birthday because when you walked into their office, there was a birthday card or you walked in the break room and there was a, a cake that said, Happy Birthday, Jen. And you might even take them to lunch on their birthday and pay for it. That's a coworker size relationship or level of relationship. Then another iteration of relationship would be like your friends, the ones that maybe they don't spend a lot of time at your house, but you'll go to dinner with them. Maybe the, 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 the right kind of movie comes out, the great love story type movies, and you know they like those movies, so as soon as it comes out, you're texting, hey, you want to go watch the new movie, and you go watch the movie together, and you go and, and you eat, uh, uh, you go out to eat at the new uh, Brazilian steakhouse, and you just, you just enjoy the whole thing. It's, it's a friend relationship that has surpassed just coworkers, meaning you, you, you don't just have lunch, you might even have dinner, and they might come to your house. But then there's a whole nother level of relationship. This is the one cousin Jojo has. It's called a refrigerator relationship. <laughs> See, cousin Jojo, even though he's got a couple screws loose, he knows you know one another well enough that he doesn't even knock on your door anymore. He doesn't come to the front door. He comes to the back door. You walk out of your bedroom, and Jojo is in your kitchen with his head in your refrigerator, and you never even knew he was there because there is a level of relationship I'm calling the refrigerator level that somebody comes in your home. They come all the way into your place that's supposed to be your place of uh, privacy and security, and don't even ask and go get the very last Sprite and drink it out of your refrigerator. 
I'm talking about the one that sees there's that much milk left in the jug and doesn't even get a glass, just turns the jug up in your house. This is that refrigerator-type relationship. God never wanted to be a convenience store relationship with you. He never wanted to be just somebody that you work with. He never wanted to be just somebody that you'd occasionally go to dinner with. He wants you to be so comfortable with him that you feel as though you could walk into his home and open his refrigerator and make yourself at home. And vice versa. Blood, sweat, respect. That's what I want to talk about today. Because when it comes to your bloodline, when it comes to your family lineage, it is absolutely imperative to know where you stand with God. Have you ever heard the term blood is thicker than water? Family over everything? See, cousin Jojo can come and drink your milk, but you're not going to co-sign for him on a loan. In other words, JoJo's access to you is not based off of JoJo's ability to keep his promise. JoJo's access to you is because of how you know him. Your access to Jesus is not based off of how well you have kept his promises. Your access to Christ is not how well you have cleaned yourself up before you met him. Your access to Christ comes because you find yourself in relationship. Somebody say relationship. You find yourself in relationship with him. You get to a place where you literally can feel comfortable. That's where the Bible says you can boldly go before the throne of grace and make your request known unto God. That's not a place of arrogance or haughtiness or otherwise. It's a place of knowing that you are in the family of God. My children don't come to me and ask me, Dad, can I have a drink of water? The reason they don't come and ask me if they can have a drink of water is because when they are in my home, they understand that everything belongs to them. They are an heir and a joint heir with their brother and sister. They can have access to, and that's what God is trying to say to you and me today. It's not about what you have done. It's about what he has done. Somebody say amen. Amen. What happened is, is some 2,000 years ago, Jesus, who had lived a spotless 33 years, the Bible says that he hung on a cross for you and for me, enduring the payment and the penalty of the sin of your life, and in the last breath, whenever he should have called legions of angels to come and wipe out humanity, instead he looked to his Father in heaven, and he said, Father or Dad, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. He literally called for forgiveness in his hardest, most difficult moment for people that had not even been born yet. You and me can cling to him because he didn't just die on the cross. The Bible says that three days later, somebody say amen, three days later, he walked out of a borrowed tomb, jingling and jangling the keys to death, hell, and the grave, giving them to blood-bought believers, endured for 40 more days with the disciples who he was training up. Then he ascended into heaven. Ten days later, the fullness of the Holy Spirit came on planet Earth, and it has started a revival that has not stopped yet. Somebody give God a hand of praise in this house. He did all these things so that you and me could have a refrigerator style relationship with Almighty God. One that says, I know you, you know me, I'm comfortable with you, you're comfortable with me. Not predicated upon what you've done, not even predicated on what you will do, but predicated on who he is. Somebody say, Amen. Matthew 7, 23, the Bible says one of the worst uh, uh, things that you would ever hear, I consider this one of the scariest Bible verses in the New Testament. Jesus said people will come to him, and he said this. He said, I will look at them, and I will say, depart from me. I never knew you. He did not say, depart from me. You didn't get it right. Depart from me, you did everything wrong. Depart from me, you never changed fast enough. He said, depart from me, I never knew you. 
There are people that have access to your home today that you wouldn't let them drive your car across the street. But because you know them, they have access to you. Jesus said what's most important is that we know each other. In other words, we begin to develop a relationship. One of my favorite songs, it says, it says Oh, to be like you, I give all I have just to know you. When you find out there are depths in knowing him, you will be motivated the rest of your very life. You have to be in the right bloodline for anything to have any permanent effect in your life. Blood, sweat, respect. If you're not in the right bloodline, none of the sweat on your brow will mean anything. None of it. When I grew up, there was a season in our life my parents had a dry cleaning business. And I would come home from school or I would go to the office after school, to the, to the laundry after school... And I would walk in, and, and there, was a, there was my dad's office, and it didn't matter who was having a meeting. I never even thought about knocking. I just opened the door and said, hey, Dad. And no matter who he was talking to, he always looked at me and said, hey, Brian, what's up? Why don't you get some money out of the cash register and get you something to drink? He never told that to any of the employees. Because there's a difference between a coworker relationship and a refrigerator relationship. You see, the amount of sweat, the amount of toil, that won't put you in the family line. Now, granted, when you become a Christian, the Bible says that we should uh, uh, provoke each other to good works. It doesn't say don't provoke people. It says just don't provoke people to anger and wrath and, and don't try to offend people. Like, don't walk around trying to offend people. Somebody say amen to that. It says provoke people to good works. That's what our life groups are about. That's what being in the house of God is about. It's provoking one another to good works. You get and you begin to talk about what God is doing, and you're encouraging one another in the things of God. All these things are wonderful, but it will mean nothing if you're not in the right bloodline. None of the sweat, none of the effort means anything if you're outside of the Family. See, you have to get in the family of God. He says this. He says, provoke each other to good works. Then he says, faith without works is? It's dead. So we know our faith has to have some action with it. But at the end of the day, he's not going to look at you and say, boy, you really worked hard. He's going to say, you can come in because I know you, or you cannot come in because I did not know you. Those are the only two options when it comes to the kingdom of God. So at the end of it all, all of our efforts ought to be put, placed uh, to the very best of our ability. The Bible says, do everything as if we're working for the Lord himself. Do everything as unto the Lord. But at the end of it, the, 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 the end of it is going to be predicated on the beginning. If you don't come through the entry point, the Bible says anybody that tries to get in any other way other than the gate or the way, the truth, and the life, they are a thief, the Bible says. You cannot go to God and say, but I worked really hard the last 20 years of my life. Number one, let me just say this. No man knows the day nor the hour that their soul will be required of them. You have to come through the door. Somebody say the door. Jesus said he was the door. Jesus said he's the way, the truth, and the life. Do you remember the Israelites? They were way back in Egypt. And the Bible says they were in captivity for like 400 years. Anybody ever heard that story just wave at me? It's in the Bible, far left side. It's a great story. The Bible says they're there, and a little boy was born named Moses. Now, this was a problem because the Egyptians were scared that the Israelites were going to outnumber them, so they were, gonna, they were killing all the baby boys that were born. So it's a spirit of abortion. It was trying to stop a life because they didn't know who the deliverer was going to be. So we're just trying to stop all the lives. So they took this little baby boy and they put him in a river, in a basket, in a river. And they floated the basket down and Pharaoh's daughter sees the baby in the basket. And she takes him and she raises him as, his own, as her own in the palace. And the Bible says when Moses got a little bit older after having been raised in the palace, that he realizes that he himself is an Israelite. 
And he looks out and he sees the Israelites being abused. And he got really angry and ended up killing a guy who was beating one of the Israelites. And he got concerned, so he ended up running away and he went out into the wilderness. And it was there in the wilderness that he found his purpose. Did you know sometimes you've got to, wait, you've got to get away from what's familiar to find out who you really are? You can't keep doing the same junk and think you're going to be different. You can't keep being around the same people and think you're going to be different. Did you know down like at the coast, they got these big uh, like, like tanks with, a, with, with, with nets in the bottom of them, and they'll put all the crabs in it, and a lot of times they don't even put a lid on, the, on, the, on where the crabs are, even though the crabs can climb right up the side. They know that as soon as one of the crabs is about to crawl out, one of the crabs beneath it is going to grab its leg and just pull it right back in. Sometimes you've got to get away from the crabs in your life or you'll never break out. Now, you can go back and get them, but somebody's got to get dry before they're going to help anybody that's all wet. You see what I'm saying? But the Bible says that, that Moses went out into the wilderness, and he came up on this bush that was on fire, but it wasn't being consumed. That's a picture of what God wants for you. He wants the fire of God to be on you, and he wants you to know that nothing you're going to come in contact with is going to consume you. You're going to endure. You're going to make it to the next step. You're going to get through this sea. Am I talking to anybody this morning? You're going to get through. You're going to go to the next level. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. I sense a great getting up anointing coming on this place right now. I think somebody's about to get to the other side of something. I think debt's about to fall off of somebody. I think sickness is about to fall off of somebody. I think somebody's about to get delivered from a stinking thinking mentality, and you're about to walk walk in a promised land mentality all the days of your life. Somebody give God a hand of praise in this place. I got good notes and I'll follow them, but sometimes I just like to preach for a minute. You know what I mean? The scripture says that Moses went out there and he saw that bush that was on fire and Moses basically was born again. He realized, well, I was born this way, but now I feel like I'm different. And he looked at, he looked at that burning bush, and he began to talk to the burning bush because the bush was talking to him. He said, take your shoes off, Moses. This is holy ground. He took his shoes off. He began to talk to him. He said, well, who are you? He said, I am that I am. He said, I'm about to do something in your life that you never thought was possible. He said, well, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to set all the people free. You're going to say to them all, how are you going to do that? He said, I'm going to use you. He said, you can't use me. I can't hardly talk. I stuttered. I stammered. He said, I didn't say. I was going to do it with your power. He said, I'm going to do it with my power, says the Lord. He said, take that stick you're carrying around and throw it down. He throws it down. It turns into a snake. Moses said, what is going on here? He said, pick the snake up. He reached down, picks it up, turned back to a stick. He said, put your hand in your jacket. He put his hand in his jacket, pulled it out, and his hand was full of leprosy. He said, put your hand back in your jacket. He put his hand in his jacket, pulled it out, was completely healed. And Moses knew in that instant God was the God that he lived thee. The Bible says, what I want you to do is I want you to go back to Pharaoh, and I want you to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Now, this is very important because Pharaoh was like the president. Whether you like the president or you don't like the president, it'd be real hard for you to get a meeting with him. But Moses, who was raised in the house... You see, God causes all things to work together for good for them that love him and are called according to his purpose. It wasn't hard for him to get a meeting because he knew the guy. He goes back over. He goes, you're going to have to let these people go or God's going to come after you. He loves his people. He's serious about his people. He's watched all the things you've done. And Pharaoh said, what God? He said, I'm telling you, this God is bad. He, threw, he goes, watch what he'll do. He threw the stick down and the stick turned into a snake. And Pharaoh said, oh, yeah, bring me some of my sorcerers, some of my warlocks, some of my witches. And he threw, and they threw some sticks down. And they turned into snakes. And everybody was like, look at that. And then all of a sudden, God's snake ate their snakes. Nobody said the devil doesn't have power. He just doesn't have any power that's more powerful than what you got. The problem is we see a little hocus pocus and we start shriveling back. I dare you to whenever that thing happens, you see a snake fall in front of you that used to be a stick to look at it and say, no weapon formed against me is going to prosper in the name of Jesus. So the Bible says he's sitting there and the, picks his snake stick back up, praise the Lord. He said, you better let him go. He said, I'm not doing it. He said, you will too. He wouldn't do it. The Bible says his heart was hard. God caused the water to turn to blood. He brought many plagues, locusts and frogs and lice. And 
It was just, it was a terrible time for everybody. And then God told Moses, he said, this last thing I'm going to bring is going to be the thing that sets my people free. He says, here's what I need you to do, Moses. He said, go back to the Israelites. He said, because I'm about to collect a debt. You see, the Bible says the wages, the payment owed for sin is death. God said, I'm about to collect. He said, I'm going to send an angel tonight. He's going to look down and he's going to collect on the debt owed the firstborn of every household. The Bible says that God told Moses, he said, but I want to pass over my people. And here's what's going to need to happen. I need you to take the blood of a lamb and I need it placed on the doorposts and the head beam of every doorway going into the houses of the Israelites. They said, not just any lamb. It's got to be a spotless lamb. You see, you couldn't pay, you could not have paid your price if you wanted to. If you were willing to, you couldn't have. A spotless lamb. And what will happen is you'll take the blood of that spotless lamb and you'll take some brush and you'll dip in the blood of that spotless lamb. And I want you to take it and I want you to put some blood on one side of the doorpost. And I want you to put some blood on the other side of the doorpost. And then I want you to take some of that blood and I want you to put it on the head post so that when that angel comes over, it sees not just blood on the top, because certainly the blood would have dripped from the top to the bottom. But when the angel looks down, he's going to see a perfect picture of a blood-stained cross. Put it on the door post. Don't put it on the door. Why shouldn't we put it on the door? Because there is one coming who is the way, the truth, and the life that calls himself the door. Why on the post? Because the Bible says, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Who are we? We are the blood-stained door post that is holding up Christ that other people might walk through him as we have. The Bible says that night, the angel comes flying over. And looks down and passes over all the houses with the beautiful bloody cross. You see, without the cross, there is no gospel. Without the blood, there is no gospel. If we get away from a blood-stained cross, we have lost the entirety of the gospel itself. There is no way to God except through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man can be saved lest they pass through him. The Bible says the angel flies over and he looks down and he sees the blood stains. And he finds houses that do not have this mark. And the debt that was owed was paid. All of Egypt began to weep and cry. All of Egypt began to feel the weight and the burden of pain that no parent should ever have to endure. The Bible says that The next morning, the Egyptians told the Israelites, we want you to leave. But not just leave. I want you to take all the gold and silver you can carry. And every Israelite that left that day had to pass through the bloodstained cross to get out of their home. You see... The angel didn't pass over their home because they were Israelites. The angel didn't even pass over their home because people knew who God was. The angel passed over their home because the blood said, death has already been here. When you say yes to Jesus, you're not saying, I haven't done anything wrong. You're saying, my payment has already been paid. My debt has already been paid. We're not arguing with the, pro- with the principles of God. We are positioning ourselves on the correct side of the promises of God. You see, he sets you in heavenly places, the Bible says. You can boldly go before God, not because you got it all figured out. You just happen to have believed him at his word. 
No amount of effort, no amount of sweat on your brow can put you in right standing with Almighty God. You have to be in the bloodline of God. You say, well, that's impossible because I've already been born. You must be born again. When you say yes to Jesus, you are not what you used to be. You're not the decisions that you made. You are what he says you are. You are not the poor choices. You are not the divorces. You are not the bad decisions. You are not the jail sentence. You are not the bankruptcy. You are not the bad idea of who God is. You are what he says he is, and he says he has set you free, and who the Son sets free is free indeed. You got to be in the family of God. Jojo eats out of your refrigerator, not because he got it right. He just happened to be in the right family. <laughs> Blood, sweat. You don't want to just be putting in effort. You want to put in effort that echoes through eternity. And it begins with deciding who he is. The next and I think most important question is who? Who can be saved? Because to be honest with you, who wouldn't want to be saved? Who would want to go to hell? Who would want to turn away from a God who freely and openly grants you access to all of his treasures? The Bible says at least seven times that God is no respecter of persons. He died for the whosoevers. Look to your left. Look to your right. You just saw a bunch of whosoevers. We're, we're not Christians because we get everything right all the time. We're Christians because Jesus got it right. Blood, sweat, Respect. He's no respecter of persons. If he did it for you, he'll do it for somebody else. If he did it for me, he'll do it for somebody else. You know, a lot of times, and this is very interesting because you'll, you'll run into this, everybody's not going to believe exactly the way you believe. That doesn't mean we should exclude them from the opportunity. Amen. For instance, little Johnny was at school the other day. And he tells his teacher, the teacher said, what did you guys learn this weekend? He said, well, I went to New Heights Kids, had a great time. It was wonderful. And I learned all about Noah's Ark and how God took all the animals two by two, put them on a boat, rained for 40 days and 40 nights. When it finally dried up, Noah opened the door and all the animals went out. And that's why we have giraffes today. <laughs> and the teacher said, little Johnny, that's not true. He said, what are you talking about? That's not true. It's in the Bible. He said, little Johnny, that's not true. There's no way all those animals could fit on a boat. There's just no way. He said, well, it's in the Bible. New High School, they told me that's exactly what it was. I believe it. It's in the Bible. She said, well, what makes you so sure? She, he said, it's in the Bible. <laughs> little Johnny just standing on faith. He said this. She said, well, little Johnny... How do you think God got all those animals to walk two by two like that? He thought for a minute. He said, well, I'll tell you what. When I get to heaven, I'll ask Noah. And the lady said, well, what if Noah didn't go to heaven? Little Johnny thought for a minute. You'll have to ask him. <laughs> Everybody's not going to believe like you believe. Everybody's not going to think how you think. But he's no respecter of persons. Don't exclude somebody that doesn't look like you. Don't exclude somebody that doesn't have a background like you have. Don't exclude somebody that's not as handsome as me. Don't exclude somebody because they don't talk how you talk, look how you look, think how you think, vote how you vote. Don't exclude somebody. He's no respecter of persons. We don't have the right to be excluding people. It will never be the voice of the devil asking you to share your faith with somebody. That's God. 
When you have the sense to tell somebody what God has done for you, when you sense that on the inside, that is the Holy Spirit asking you to do something. That is the Holy Spirit nudging and urging you in the direction that he's called you to go. Make absolutely certain that we don't get in the process of excluding people because in the kingdom of God, he is no respecter of persons. He'll take a kid from deep east Texas and put a word in his mouth and say, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use you and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to put a, a message in your mouth and I'm going to give you an ability to study and I'm going to give you a voice in the right time and the right place. When, you're, when it's time and you're ready, I'm going to begin to cause people to be changed and say, all just because he's, made, he's no respecter of persons. He doesn't look around and say, you, 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 not you, not you, not you, 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 you. It's not like that at all. He's casting the biggest, broadest net possible. So what's a whosoever look like? Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come unto me, all that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Doesn't the weight of this world just weigh you down? The decisions... The stuff we just have to endure. Doesn't it just weigh you down? The insecurities, the poor decisions. The relationship we know we should have cut off, but we haven't cut it off. Doesn't it just weigh you down? This is who he's talking to. You've tried it your way. You've tried it your way. You've... you. You, 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 you've tried it every way you can try it. Oh, you can mask it. You can drink it away. And it'll come off of you for a little bit. At least it feels like it does. You can smoke it away. You can gossip it away. You can ignore it away. But like a bad dream, it shows up when nobody else is around and you're heavy laden. Guilt for what you did or what you didn't do. I wish I'd have been better at this. I wish I hadn't done that. Everybody's got it. Ah. It's not for you to carry. The Bible says the government was upon His shoulders. Peter, who knew him very well, says, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. Come to me. All that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Somebody say rest. Rest is a commodity that in the world today, very few people actually tap into. Oh, you may go to sleep. You might even sleep eight hours, but you can't sleep without thinking about tomorrow. You're asleep, but you're not resting. The calling of God is stirring up on the inside of you constantly. You can't get away from it. The enemy is trying to get you to pacify it with anything that you can think of. And you never address the reality of it. You're heavy laden. Only he can give you rest. Only him. He said, come to me. All that labor and are heavy laden, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. I'm gentle and humble, says the Lord. That's one of my favorite parts about Jesus is he's gentle and humble. (laughs) He doesn't have to be. I think humility is the highest form of confidence. He says, I'm meek and lowly in heart. You come to me, and then get this. I love this. I sense him here even now. You'll find rest for your soul. Put a price on that. How much is rest for your soul worth to you? I think it's worth giving your whole life. Oh, you really think that? Yeah, I really think that. I've really considered it. I think it's worth giving your whole life.
This is not said to impress you. It's just said to impress upon you that I'm serious. My wife and I came here. We didn't know one human being in Brazos County that we knew of because God told us to come over here and start preaching. Yeah, we'll give our life. I'm not playing. It's not a game to me. It's not something I do as a vocation. <laughs> this is a calling. And the thing is, he's calling you today. If you don't know him, he's saying, come to me. Let me give you rest. If you know him, he's saying today as a reminder, rest is available. Peace is available. Hope again. Hope again. Somebody's going to leave out of here today, and they're going to believe God again for big things. You're going to dream again like you did when you were a kid. It's like the life will just knock the enthusiasm out of you. Somebody's going to get some enthusiasm back today. That's one of the reasons we shout around here, because nobody shouts anywhere. Nobody gets excited about anything anymore. Everybody acts like nothing's a big deal. I don't want to wake up and there'd be a rock next to me shouting about how good God is. The Bible says that if we don't shout, rocks will shout. All of the creation declares His majesty. All of it. I want to be in that chorus. Oh, to be like you. I give all I have just to know you. All I have to know you. Just, just let me know you, Lord. Because when you know him, everything begins to shift. Everything begins to fall in place. You say, oh, it doesn't look like it. No, it doesn't always look like it. But he gives you peace that surpasses everything going around up here. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Don't let the devil lie to you. Living for God's not that big of a deal. It'll change your whole life. But he does the hard work. Oh, I know. Take up your cross and carry it. I get it. I do it every day. But if he said the yoke is easy and the burden's light, I'm not going to start arguing with it, try to act like it's real hard to live for Jesus. I believe it was hard when he carried that wooden beam up a rock hill to be murdered on it. I think that's what was hard. I think what was hard was descending into the depths of hell and leading captivity captive. I think that was hard. I think what was hard was stepping on the neck of the devil and prying the keys to death, hell, and the grave out of his twist, gnarled hand. I think that was hard. I think it was difficult when he walked out of that tomb and declared that there's a new thing coming. I think that was hard. I think it was difficult whenever everybody was chastising him and he chose to say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I think that was hard. I think it was hard when Peter denied him and he didn't choose to deny Peter. I think that was hard. I don't think living for God is hard. I think his yoke is easy and his burden is light. That's what I think. I think what would be difficult would be going into eternity not knowing where my offspring were going to go. That would be difficult. I don't think living for God is hard. I think you have to be decisive about it, but I don't think it's hard. Not in the scale of difficulty. Three rusty nails and a spear? Or praying for your friends? I think the nails are hard. Who can be saved? Anybody. Anybody. One of my other favorite songs, and I, I sing it privately more than any because it's just one of those songs I like. I don't know if everybody else likes it. But it kind of depicts a real intimate setting. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing here when it comes to giving rest. It goes like this. It says, I want to sit at your feet, drink from the cup in your hand. Lay back against you and breathe. Feel your heart beat. This love is so deep. It's more than I can stand. I'm melting your peace. It's overwhelming me. See, 
got the gas station relationship, the co-worker relationship, the friend zone. Then you've got that refrigerator relationship. But it's a whole nother level when you're willing to drink after somebody. <laughs> Think about it. When you say yes to Jesus, you are a part of the church, not necessarily New Heights, the church, global. The church is called the bride of Christ. He's called the bridegroom. When the kids finally go to bed, and it's just me and Crystal, and we sit on the couch, we go to bed wherever we are, and she sits down next to me and fits perfectly right here with her head on my shoulder. She reaches over and grabs my sweet tea. <laughs> takes a drink. That's real relationship. That's what he wants with you. So close that it's hard to even see the separation. Where do you stop and he starts? I want to sit at your feet, drink from the cup in your hand, lay back against you and breathe, feel your heart beat. This love is so deep, it's more than I can stand. I melt in your peace. Come to me, everybody who is heavy laden, and let me give you rest. I melt in your peace. It's overwhelming. I mean, overwhelming. See, there's a peace that's stronger than your doubt. There's a peace that's stronger than your issues. It's more powerful than your concerns. I'm not saying they don't exist. My God, I got them too. I just don't magnify them. I'm melting your peace. It's overwhelming. Let the peace of God overwhelm and envelop all of your problems today. I'm not saying you don't have to get up and go to work tomorrow because you'd get bored not working. I'm saying let that peace that's readily available saturate and change who you are. Bow your head and close your eyes, please, for just a few moments. Blood, sweat, respect. You got to be in the right bloodline. The sweat on your brow means nothing if you don't come in through the entry point. What's the entry point? Jesus is the way. There is no other respect. Who? Anybody. No respecter of persons. Anybody. Will he change me? He will really really change you he'll save your very soul he'll blot out all of your sins transgressions and failures he'll set your feet on a solid rock every head bowed every eye closed and the overflows as well speaking to you now as well if you're here and you're not right with God you came to church on the correct day. Everything's about to change for you. If somebody brought you here, they have been praying for you feverishly for this moment. That you would stop ignoring the call of God on your life and you would jump in with both feet. If you're here and you say, I'm not right with God, I'm not living right, I'm not doing right, Jesus is not Lord of my life. Or maybe you'd say it like this, and this will be many of you. I used to walk strong with God, but something happened, and I'm backslidden. I'm like the prodigal son. He might still be my Savior, but I have not been in that close relationship that I know is available. That refrigerator relationship. If that's you, you've never given your heart to Jesus or, and I sense the presence of the Lord even while I'm speaking, you say, I need to give my life back to him. If that's you, when I count to three, I want you to lift your hand. 
And with an uplifted hand, you're simply saying, oh God, remember me, and believe me, he really, really will. Never said yes to Jesus, or you know you need to come back to him. When I count to three, lift your hand, and the overflow as well. One, two, three, lift your hand. Hey guys, we just want to thank you for joining us online. We hope you enjoyed today's broadcast. Here at New Heights, we are passionate about two things, loving people and pointing them to Christ. So help us by liking, sharing, and commenting on everything you see come across our social media. It means the world to us. If you like what you've experienced today, you can also revisit this message you just watched or any other sermon at newheightschurch.info. We hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time.